the Muslims are horrible. There is no question about that. However, what Junko Furuta had to go through in the late 80s was probably the worst and was considered the worst case of juvenile delinquency in post-war Japan. Close your doors, turn your lights off, and let's get started. Today's cruise to the dark side will take us to Japan and its capital, Tokyo. Known for the discipline of its population and its safety, for its history and culture, Japan is part of the Ring of Fire and spans 6,852 islands, the five main ones being Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, Kyushu, and Okinawa. Japan is a great power and a member of numerous international organizations. Although it has renounced its right to declare war, the country maintains self-defense forces that rank as one of the world's strongest militaries. After World War II, Japan experienced record growth in an economic miracle, the second largest economy in the world by 1990. As of March 1980, the unemployment rate in Japan was 4.9%, a very low number compared to the unemployment rate during the height of the 90s. But the following decade would see Japan's economy decline substantially, giving rise to the name the lost decade. It is in the dawn of this collapse that our story will begin. Day 1, 25th of November 1988, it's 8.30pm, it's dark and pretty chill already in the street of Misato. People are heading back home after a long day at work, just like Furuta, 16. She finished her shift at work and was riding her bike back home, until a man, well, a teenager actually, just randomly pushed her. Falling, she looked up, seeing him running away. Slowly getting up, feeding her legs to make sure she didn't hurt anything, she saw another boy running towards her, seemingly concerned. Are you alright? I saw what happened. Do you need help? Asked Miano while helping her pick up her bike. Mm-hmm, thank you, replied Furuta, still confused about what happened. But recognizing him, he was a student from her high school. She felt better seeing a familiar face. Noticing her distress, like a gentleman, Miano proposed to walk her back safely to her house. Because he was a familiar face, Furuta accepted, and they started walking, with a little chat along the way. Furuta trusted this familiar stranger. Not noticing, he slowly took the lead. He didn't even know her address, but she was still following him. The scenery was changing, and more abandoned buildings were appearing. She was no stranger to the city, she lived there her whole life, but she never came on this side of it, and it seemed like they were getting further away from their destination rather than closer to it. Starting to get scared and cold, they approached a nearby warehouse. There. His behavior completely changed. He started yelling at her and threatening her, proudly reminding her of his Yakuza connections. The feared organized crime group in Japan. Then she remembered. This boy was feared in her school. Everyone avoided him. He was dangerous. But he asked her out once and she politely refused. She wasn't interested in any sort of romantic relationship and wanted to focus on her studies. He did not take it well, evidently. 
It seemed like he wanted some sort of revenge for the audacity she had to reject him. Maybe it was the first time he couldn't get what he wanted by simply asking. So this time, he decided to take it by force. And so he did, raping her in that warehouse. But not quite done with her, he took her to a nearby hotel and raped her two more times there, still threatening to kill her. After the rapes, proud of himself, feeling more in control, he called his friends, Minato, Ogura, and Watanabe, and bragged about what he did, while looking at her sobbing in the corner of the room. Ogura, captivated by his story, wanted him to keep her so they could have their fun with her as well. Just like they did with the teenager a few days prior. Used to gang rape, robberies and all sorts of crimes, Minato decided to meet up with them in a nearby park. It was 3 a.m. already. The group was waiting in the park when they saw Miyano walking towards them, firmly holding Furuta from the arm. Her head was bowed down, avoiding eye contact, but when getting closer to them, Miano halted and lifted her face up, as if to show them his prize. That's when she saw him, the same guy who pushed her from her bike, and she understood it was all a play. Miano was never simply trying to help her, he was never just there. They built the whole masquerade to catch her. Was she the main target? Probably not. It was a habit for them to find prey, women to rape and rob frequently. Looking at her from head to toe, they exchanged nods and expressive smiles, then proceeded to check her bags and belongings to try and find anything valuable they could keep, but they didn't. However, they found in one of her books the address of her house, threatening her this time to use their Yakuza connection to kill her family if she attempted anything. Day 2 Deciding they wanted to have some more fun with her, they took her to Minato's house, owned by his parents, which became their hangout place. There. They gang-raped her multiple times and decided to keep her for longer than usual. They had big plans for her. Minato's parents, scared of their own son, didn't dare question the group and preferred to keep a blind eye. Believing Furuta when she told them that she was their son's girlfriend. A barely disguised lie. But soon, the group didn't even try to hide what they were doing from the parents as it became very clear they were not planning to say anything, even when Furuta begged for their help. Too afraid of their son and his relation with the Yakuza, who became increasingly violent even towards them. Even Minato's brother was aware of the situation, but did nothing to prevent it. Day 3 Already three days had passed. It was the 27th of November, and Furuta's parents contacted the police to report her disappearance. Starting an investigation and big search parties, the case made some noise. So to avoid any sort of nuisance, the group forced Furuta to call her parents and convince them she was safe and happy with friends, that she just decided to run away and beg them to stop the police investigation. And they did. Day 4 They decided to shave her pubic hair, forced her to dance to music naked and masturbate in front of them to arouse them, then raped her again. Day 5 They had fun inserting objects in her vagina and anus. Little matches, metal rods, bottles, fireworks that they would explode inside of her, scissors, bottles, iron bars, hot exploding light bulbs, grilled chicken skewers, roasting needles. 
Day 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 went by the same way, the same tortures and rapes, about a week in, and they felt generous and decided to share her with other men, gang raping her daily, burning her with lighter fluid, forcing her to lay down and dropping weights on her body, using her as a punching bag for hours on end, hanging her from the ceiling until she lost consciousness. Day 17 The torture continued, and the more they beat her, the worse she looked, and less attracted to her they were, increasing the violence even more because of that. Beating her so hard, her nose was clogged with blood she couldn't even breathe from it starving her and letting her sleep outside on the balcony, barely wearing anything under freezing temperatures, urinating on her, stucking her in the freezer for hours, twisting one of her nipples off with pliers, mutilating her private parts. Her body was covered with injuries, open wounds and infected ones, that kept reopening with every beating, every punishment, Furuta was unrecognizable. Every day, she begged them to kill her, but every day they beat her more for it, forced her to drink and eat her own waste, eat cockroaches, burned her eyelids and face, beat her up every way they could and knew how to. But every attempt to survive meant more torture. Every hope she had was crushed. Day 23 One day, about three weeks in, she heard the police knock on the door, asking if she was inside. Apparently, one of the boys who raped her, who was invited by the gang, was overwhelmed by guilt and confessed to his brother what he did, and the brother told the authorities. Arriving to Minato's house, his parents opened the door. Seeing the police, they were afraid, but they stayed calm and affirmed that there was no girl living with them, let alone a certain Furuta, pulling up a great acting performance, even inviting the police to come in to check the house themselves. Foolishly, the policemen decided it must be true. The Minatos were guiltless if they were even inviting the men taking that risk. So they left the house without even searching for Junko, who was downstairs, crying for help. Day 30 Between two Komato states, between beatings, she managed to dial an emergency number. But the boy snatched the phone from her hand and hung up before Junko was able to say anything. When the police called back, Miano assured them it has been a mistake, and again they believed him. As punishment, they poured lighter fuel on Junko's legs and feet and set them on fire. They burned her eyelids with lighter and hot wax and smashed her fingers. Her body was so weak, the internal bleeding she was suffering from didn't even allow her to eat. She threw up every time she tried, which caused even more beating, because she dared dirtying the carpets. She was so weak, it took her one hour to climb up the stairs to get to the bathroom. But eventually, she became incontinent, confined to the bedroom floor of Minato's room. Her body was rotting, but she was still alive. Day 40 The 4th of January 1989 A month has passed, and Junko was transformed beyond imagination. That even the boys didn't find her attractive anymore and were disgusted by her. They were disgusted by her appearance and smell, causing them to hate her even more 
and beat her up for it. So they decided to head out and find another woman coming back from home just like Furuta. And they found one, a 19-year-old, that they gang raped. Heading back home, proud again, Miyano decided to play mahjong with Furuta, but she beat him, causing him and the rest of the group to rage and take it once again on her. The group kicked her and punched her, ignited a candle and dripped hot wax on her face. After kicking her, she fell onto a stereo unit and collapsed into a fit of convulsions. Since she was bleeding profusely and pus was emerging from her infected burns and wounds, the four boys covered their hands in plastic bags so that her pus wouldn't get on their hands. They continued to beat her and dropped an iron exercise ball on her stomach several times. They poured lighter fluids on her thighs and arms and face and stomach and set her on fire once again. But this time was the last time. She was finally dead. 500 rapes, more than 100 men, 44 days, uncountable tortures, but it was over. She was finally in peace pain-free, back to who she was, shoulder length, dark wavy hair, high cheekbones, big eyes and a contagious smile, Junko Furuta was a beautiful girl, who was starting to attract the attention of boys her age or a little older, but she wasn't interested, she was focused on her studies, her job and her family, she was a good student, loved by her friends, and stayed away from trouble. Despite her age that could inspire rebellion, she kept to herself and avoided it. Born and raised in Misato, the second of three siblings, but the only daughter, she attended Yashio Minami High School and worked part-time at a plastic molding factory after school hours since October 1988 to be able to save up money for a graduation plan. Wanting her independence and hard working, she even got a second job at an electronic retailer, where she planned on working after graduation. The graduation she will never attend, but at least she was in peace now, pain free. It was finally over. Day 41. It took 24 hours for the boys to understand she was dead. Not sorry the slightest. They simply knew they needed to get rid of the body. To avoid any sort of problem with justice. So, wrapping her body in a blanket. And shoving her in the travel bag. They took it to an abandoned field. Where they put it in a 55 gallon drum and filled it with wet concrete. At around 8 p.m., they loaded it and eventually disposed of the drum into a cement truck in Koto, Tokyo. If it wasn't for a misunderstanding, what happened to Furuta would have never been discovered. Everyone believed she was alive and well. But on January 23, 1989, Miyano and Ogura were arrested for the gang rape of the 19-year-old whom they had kidnapped in December. During the interview, the police suspected them of two other murders, a woman and her 7-year-old son, that had occurred nine days prior to Furuta's abduction. So, during the interview, they didn't specify what they were talking about, only the time frame, and pretended they knew what happened, and pushed Ogura to talk. Ogura, thinking they were talking about Furuta and that Miyano had talked already, confessed to it. Despite the police being puzzled at first, not understanding what he was talking about, they knew better than to stop him and just followed his lead, going to the site the next day, where they discovered Furuta, who they thought was just a runaway case. But because of the state Furuta's body was in, they couldn't identify her easily, 
intel matching her fingerprints. After the autopsy, several DNA was found on and inside the victim's body, starting with Ogura's arrest on the 1st of April 1989. Watanabe, Minato, and Minato's brother followed not long after, but also Tetsuo Nakamura and Koishi Yara, who were charged with rape. Even though sealed by the court, since the main culprits were all juveniles at the time of the crime, referring to them in official documents as boy A, B, C and D, the identities of the boys were found and revealed by a journalist from a magazine who felt that, no matter their age, they didn't deserve the right to anonymity after what they did. All four boys pled guilty to committing bodily injury that resulted in death, rather than murder. Boy A, Hiroshi Miyano, 18 at the time of the crime, the alleged leader of it all, was sentenced to 17 years in prison and $450,000 of damage to be given back to Furuta's family in July 1990. After his appeal to his sentence, Judging it was way too high compared to the crime, but not agreeing to it, a Tokyo High Court judge raised it to 20 years, the second highest sentence given in Japan before life imprisonment. After his release, he was arrested for fraud, but due to insufficient evidence, he is now free to do whatever he wants with his life. Boy B, Nobuharu Minato, 16 at the time of the crime, had a four to six year sentence, and just like Miyano, saw his sentence increase to five to nine years after his appeal. His parents and brother were not charged, which angered Furuta's parents, who started and won a civil suit against the parents of Minato. After his release, Minato moved in with his mother. He has not worked since. In 2018, Minato was arrested again for attempted murder after beating a 32-year-old man with a metal rod and slashing his throat with a knife. Boy C, Yasushi Watanabe, 17 at the time of the crime. Following his friends who had an upgraded sentence, his changed from 3 to 4 years to 5 to 7 years in prison. Boy D, Ogura, 17 at the time of the crime, the only one who didn't appeal his sentence served eight years in a juvenile prison before he was released in August 1999. After his release, he took the family name Kamisaku when he was adopted by a supporter of his. He is said to have boasted about his role in the kidnapping, rape and torture of Furuta. In July 2004, he was arrested for assaulting Takatoshi Izono, an acquaintance he thought his girlfriend may have been involved with. Ogura tracked Izonu down, beat him and shoved him into his truck, then took him to his mother's bar in Minato, where he beat him for four hours straight. During the beating, he repeatedly threatened to kill the man, telling him that he had killed before and he knew how to get away with it. He was sentenced to seven years in prison for assaulting the man, but has been released since. Ogura's mother allegedly vandalized Furuta's grave stating that she had ruined her son's life. It was also reported that he depleted his father's savings, money that was supposed to be given to Furuta's family as compensation. Many believe that the sentences were way too light for the severity of the crimes committed. Junko Furuta's funeral was held on the 2nd of April 1989. During her funeral, her future employer presented her parents with the uniform she would have worn in the position she was accepted in. The uniform was placed in her casket, and at her graduation, Furuta's school principal presented her high school diploma, which was given to her parents. The location near where Furuta's body was discovered was now transformed and became Wakasu Park. During the memorial, one of her friends stated, Jun Shan, welcome back. I 
have never imagined that we would see you again in this way. You must have been in so much pain, so much suffering. The happy we all made for the school festival looked really good on you. We will never forget you. I have heard that the principal has presented you with a graduation certificate. So we graduated together, all of us. Junshan, there is no more pain, no more suffering. Please, rest in peace. Until next time, stay safe.